I'm uh, Bill Leahy, and for those of you who don't uh, know who Bill Leahy is, I'm the president of uh, this fine university, King's College. And so, uh, welcome to King's uh, and to the uh, Oriel McLennan uh, Annual Lecture in the History of Science and Technology, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to give a special welcome, obviously, to Dr. Uh, Duffin and her husband, uh, Robert, our guests of honor. The um, room is full of people. Uh, you can just uh, feel the anticipation for this lecture. I, I felt that way as well, just on the topic, even though I didn't know very much about it at all. But now I've had the pleasure of spending 20 minutes with uh, Jacqueline, and so I, now I'm really looking forward to the lecture. <laughs> Uh, the level of enthusiasm in the room when there was no one in it but her went up and up and up. <laughs> so that's great. Um, as we gather on behalf of us all, I want to acknowledge that we gather on the territorial and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people and that we gather here under the treaties uh, between the Mi'kmaq and the Crown that are a fundamentally important part of the Constitution of Canada and the country of Canada that we uh, share. Uh, <clears throat> the um, annual McLennan Lecture, uh, and this is our second annual uh, event, offers students and researchers and the public a unique opportunity to discuss pressing issues in science and medicine with some of today's most innovative historians and philosophers of science. And that sentence says a lot about uh, Kings because we are a place that thinks of the sciences and medicine as part of humanities. Or you could say it the other way around, we think of humanities as part of science and medicine. This lecture is right at the core of what we try to do in this little college to integrate uh, great ideas and great thinking uh, from across the disciplines. Um, the lecture funds a visiting scholar to present a public lecture in the field of science and technology studies or in the field of history and philosophy of science. Uh, King students also will have, or maybe already have had, the opportunity to spend time with the visiting lecturer in a seminar uh, setting. Um, Oriel McLennan, and Oriel is here tonight. Can you put your hand up, Oriel? There she is right there. Can we have a, a round of applause? Um, she's a former reference and circulation librarian at Dalhousie, and she's a lifelong enthusiast uh, of and for the history of science. And she reminds us by establishing this lecture, um, the vital role of humanities uh, must play uh, in the sciences as we address, as a, as a society, the multifaceted issues raised by the rapid developments we see taking place all around us in science, in technology, uh, and medicine. And uh, with uh, uh, um, thanks to Dr. Melanie Frappier, one of our professors in science and technology. I'll end by just saying there can be no better way to recognize and honor someone's passion than by igniting it in others. And that's what this lecture and visiting scholarship is all about. I'm going to uh, call on my colleague, uh, Dr. Goran McEwitt, to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks. And now he turns on the mic, <laughs> meaning uh, I'll repeat everything that <laughs> Billy Hees know. Or I'll just yell at you. Can you hear me? <laughs> right, good. The, uh, hopefully the... Um, it's, I'm standing on a little platform here, and now I'm taller than both the president and uh, Jackie's. It's nice to be taller. Uh, Jackie Duffin is a trained uh, he uh, hematologist. That's it. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, the, if people that don't know what that is, it's uh, study of the blood. There's an interesting relationship to the Vatican on this, and I'm not going to just look it up. Jackie Duffin and Vatican, and one of our saints uh, has been given the thumbs up by a study of blood. But she's also a historian and a philosopher of medicine. No, I, I think actually she's the historian and philosopher of medicine. That's no exaggeration. Uh, she is Emeritus uh, Hannah Chair of the History of Medicine at Queen's since uh, 1998, where if you look on a CV or the descriptions in Queen's, she has won every kind of award imaginable. And she asked me to keep this uh, short. 
uh, so I will not list them. Uh, but there's also including the Jackie uh, Duffin Award, which you have not won. Uh, she is a former president of the American Association uh, for the History of Medicine and the Canadian Society for History of Medicine, fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and uh, the Academy of Health Sciences. And it was just announced, uh, or it's in the, pro no, it's announced. it's announced that she is now inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. Which is like the hockey call, <laughs> but only, uh, uh, only with more blood. Uh, our students uh, in the burgeoning history of medicine uh, programs and uh, medical humanities class uh, that we are beginning to establish at King's with the uh, um, support of Dalhousie know her through her marvelous uh, book, The History of Medicine, and this catches the tone, uh, a scandalously short introduction, and it's a thick book. Um, it's uh, full of humanity, wit, and penetrating insight, and it has a penumbra around it of resources that students uh, use constantly for writing in the uh, history and philosophy of medicine. Uh, she is an author of many, many more books. I will not list them all, except for to highlight someone that you might want to look up. Medical Miracles in 2009, uh, Lovers and Livers, uh, Disease Concepts and History, which is the Joanne Goodman uh, Lectures in 2005, and I think Dick Goldman is here. Hi, related to the family. Um, uh, she wrote The History of Te Telescope, uh, Life of R.T. Lanik, and, uh, and a pile more. Um, so rather than take up your time, I'm going to let you talk about the Canadian uh, medical uh, expedition to Easter Island. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Gordon, thank you, President Leahy. Um, thank you especially to Oriel McClellan for being here and for creating this wonderful idea to support an excellent program in university. King's is actually famous in my field for the quality of its education in history and philosophy of science, so it was a privilege to be invited to come here. Uh, it's a privilege to be doing this talk in Halifax. Um, I want to thank my family members who are here, my cousin Barbara from Wolfville, my in-law Barbara from Lunenburg, and Dr. Richard Goldblum who is here, a uh, family member because my daughter is married to his grandson. <laughs> so that practically makes me a Haligonian. <laughs> and also to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Jock Murray. Where are you, Jock? There he is at the back. Um, Dr. Goldblum and Dr. Murray are already in the Medical Hall of Fame, so I am enjoying some illustrious people with that. And to acknowledge also the president of the Canadian Society for the History of Medicine, Peter Tuhig, uh, who is here this evening. Thank you, Peter. Um, there are many friends who are also here, people I taught, people I studied with, but very specially, and we'll get into it more later, there are people who went on this expedition. So would you please stick your hand up if you went on the expedition? Yes. Which, which happened 54 years ago. Now, will you please stick your hand up if you're related to someone who went on the expedition? <laughs> Even more, and they deserve a hand too. Because in fact, the expedition got forgotten, not by those people, but by the rest of the country. So tonight, I'm going to, this is an outline, I'm going to tell you how I got started in doing this project. I'm going to explain to you what METI was, that's what it called itself, the medical expedition to Easter Island, about why it went there, what they were trying to do, and what the products were, or lack thereof, and what's going to happen next. I got invited to be a visiting professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, for an entire week in January 2014, and it was typical BC weather. Uh, that was the most I saw of the mountains the entire time I was there. Uh, January in Halifax, January in Vancouver, pretty much the same. And I had a lot of time in between the guest lectures that I was doing uh, to hang out, but because the weather was so lousy, I just stayed at the campus, and I went to the archives, which I do went for fun when I go places, and I plugged in the usual words, medicine, history, to see what would come up, and up came 
this term, medical expedition to Easter Island, 1964-65. And I thought, what is that? I'd never heard of it. And so I ordered up the files, and out came three big boxes full of papers. And they had been deposited by one Ian Efford, a biologist and ecologist at UBC, in the 1970s. So I figured he was long gone. Maybe he existed no more, and he just left all his records to the university. And I began reading these records in my spare time, taking photographs, talking to the archivist, and trying to see if anyone had written anything about it in the evenings. Well, I found a couple of articles. I found a book. I found a few things written back in the 1960s, but no scholar had taken it on. The book was more of a memoir by someone who'd been on the expedition. It was the idea, the brainchild, the dream of Dr. Stanley Scorina. Here he is. And Stanley Scorina was a surgeon by training, but he was also a researcher with many brilliant ideas about how we get diseases, where they come from, humans living within their environment. He was an immigrant to Canada, born in Poland, studied in Czechoslovakia, and he won an award, a research fellowship, came to Canada for one year, and you know what happens when that, <laughs> he stayed for the rest of his life. And here he is on the ship with the logo of Metai, with the two Easter Island statues on either side. So what was his idea, and why did he want to go to Easter Island? I learned in doing this research that there was an international biological program at that time because of the worries afflicting the Cold War. They were worried about radioactive fallout from the nuclear test explosions. They were worried about generalized environmental pollution in the environment. They were worried about overpopulation because as uh, children were living longer and infant mortality declined, the world was getting full of people and they were worried would there be enough food for everybody and how were people going to survive these terrible challenges. To find the solutions, the scientists in an international group agreed that they should collaborate to understand how human beings adapt to these problems and that International groups of scientists should collaborate together on little mini projects and then put them all together like a mosaic to learn more about human ability to adapt to situations. And the few scholars who have studied this, and believe me, another book deserves to be written about the International Biological Program. So any grad students out there looking for a topic, this is a good one. I'm not going to do it. But what has been said is that it was the beginning of ecology because it was worried about human organisms within their world. And this graph shows you the number of times the word ecology appears in uh, titles in the Science Citation Index. And you can see that it's almost nothing. The word had been invented a long time ago, but it was almost nothing. And then along came METI and the International Biological Program simultaneously, and it begins to rise. So the few scholars who've looked at it said, this was the moment when the world started recognizing ecology as an important discipline.